are the oversimplification of early detection, screening mammography, and breast cancer overdiagnosis. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Education and Mobilization Coordinator at Breast Cancer Action. On the webinar today, our presenters will be Tracy Wheat, Breast Cancer Action Board Chair and Director of the Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health Program at the University of California, San Francisco. Also joining us is Gilbert Welch, Professor of Medicine at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Research. I have a few quick announcements before we get started. I wanted to let you know about a few upcoming webinars we will have. Our first webinar in April will focus on fracking and breast cancer. Our presenters will be Annie Sarter, here from Breast Cancer Action. Also joining her will be Jennifer Krill from Earthworks and Karen Miller from the Huntington Breast Cancer Action Coalition. And that will be on April 29th and 30th. Also in May, our webinar will focus on breast cancer media literacy with Gary Schweitzer from Health News Review and Mandy Starr, who's a reviewer for Health News Review. And that will be May 29th and 30th. You can check on our website for more information about those upcoming webinars. I wanted to let you know that Breast Cancer Action doesn't take money from any corporation that profits from or contributes to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors. Please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. Our presentation of the oversimplification of early detection, screening mammography, and breast cancer overdiagnosis will last about 40 minutes. We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions. Please feel free to type in questions during the presentation, and we'll make sure to get to as many questions as we can at the end. Everyone except the speakers will be muted during the webinar to cut down on background noise and to ensure that we can all hear well. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action. This webinar is a great way to do that. Please stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on. So I'm going to start with our agenda for today. Tracy will frame our discussion today by deconstructing the early detection saves lives mantra, and she'll also discuss the benefits and harms of mammography. And last, she will talk specifically about the harms of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Gilbert will explain his findings from his study on the effect of three decades of screening mammography on breast cancer incidence. And I will end our talk today to talk about what this information means for you. Breast Cancer Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women who were frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency, and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crises. Breast Cancer Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the epidemic. Our advocacy is conducted through a social justice lens because the politics and policies of breast cancer disproportionately affect poor women and women of color. Breast Cancer Action's independence from pharmaceutical company funding puts us in a unique position to address issues of health equity and exposures to toxins in our environment, and to put the needs of patients before pharmaceutical company profits. We have three main program priorities. The first is putting patients first, where we advocate at the Food and Drug Administration in favor of treatments that are less toxic, more effective, and less expensive than those already available. We also provide information about breast cancer to anyone who needs it. Second is creating healthy environments, where we work to reduce the involuntary exposures people encounter that put them at risk for breast cancer by holding corporations accountable for unhealthy products and practices. We also support legislation that would better protect us from chemicals in our environment and that would make personal care products safer. And last is eliminating social inequities related to breast cancer, where we work to create awareness that it is not just genes, but social injustices, political, economic, and so racial inequalities that lead to disparities in breast cancer incidence and outcomes. So our speakers today, the first is Tracy Wheat. She's the director of the Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health Program 
and associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. She is also the board chair for Breast Cancer Action. Dr. Weed's passion is for those aspects of women's health which are marginalized, either for ideological reasons or because the populations affected, affected lack the means of mechanisms to have their concerns raised. Her current research focuses on innovative strategies to expand abortion provision in the U.S. Tracy has a master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in healthcare from Missouri Southern University and a doctoral degree in medical sociology from UCSF. Welcome, Tracy. Our other presenter is Dr. Gilbert Welch. He's a general internist at the White River Junction VA and a professor of medicine at the Dartmouth, Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. For the past two decades, Dr. Welch's research has focused on the problems created by medicine's efforts to detect disease early. Much of his work is focused on overdiagnosis and cancer screening. In particular, screening for melanoma, thyroid, lung, breast, and prostate cancer. He co-authored the study Effects of Three Decades of Screening Mammography on Breast Cancer Incidents, and he has recently published his second book, Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. Welcome, Gilbert. Thank you. So I wanted to start with a quote from Otis Brawley, the Chief Medical Officer for the American Cancer Society. He said, I'm admitting that American medicine has overpromised when it comes to screening. The advantages to screening have been exaggerated. Breast Cancer Action believes that women need access to unbiased information in order to make informed choices about the detection of breast cancer. Our work on screening recognizes that breast cancer detection requires us to look beyond mammography. We work to promote better tools for detecting breast cancer that are not radiation-based, to support research to effectively distinguish between types of breast cancer, and to make sure that everyone has, a, has access to the best tools and care available. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tracy. Thanks, um, and thanks everyone for joining us on this beautiful day here in California. I don't know where you all are, but it's beautiful here. Before I start, I wanted to remind everybody that breast cancer is intensely personal. We often come to this um, issue because of a personal diagnosis or a diagnosis in a friend or family, and many of us may feel that mammography itself is the reason that we're alive. But as we learn and advance the science of mammography, it's important for us to think about the limitations of this technology, and in particular, the question of whether or not the harms from the technology may be more than we originally thought. So breast cancer is intensely personal, but of course, it's also important to remember that it's political. My slides aren't moving. <laughs> Saru, I think I don't have have control. You do have control. Just click on the screen. There, there you go. we go. So they're highly political, and many of the decisions made about the availability of mammography and what we know about mammography are filtered through a political lens. There's also highly commercialized. Breast Cancer Action has taken a long interest in the corporations profiting from the pushing and support of breast cancer awareness and the, and the focus on a mammography as the sole solution to the breast cancer epidemic. But mostly, the science has been incredibly confusing. If you followed the mammography debate over the last couple of years, you may think, do we actually really know anything? You know, we tell you one thing, and then the next day someone else says something you know, different, and then a task force comes out with recommendations, and then there's a ton of backlash. I hope that the science, in particular, that Gil will share with you today, will put this larger debate within a bigger context and will give you some tools to evaluate the science as it evolves in the future. So breast cancer itself and the way we think about breast cancer is particularly outdated. So the way that most of us learned about breast cancer, and myself included, is the idea that breast cancer was a disease, it was a single disease, that grew progressive and more deadly over time. So it was small, and then as it grew, it became more deadly. This way of thinking about breast cancer led us to adopt a sort of universalist approach in which early detection became the way that we understood the best way to save people's lives. That is, if you could find tumors when they were smaller, 
and you could eradicate them, you could remove the chance of dying from the disease. And while this model is true for some breast cancers, it is not true for all breast cancers. And because this is the basis of the mammography assumption, it's important for us to think about what we have learned in the last few decades of breast cancer research. We know that breast cancers now are far more complicated than we ever thought. Not all breast cancers are alike. That is, there are different types of cancers, and they behave in different kinds of ways. That not all breast cancers can be found. Some breast cancers just, by the time they um, present, and we'll talk about those kinds, um, uh, uh, are themselves lethal and deadly, and they weren't findable at an early at an early stage. I think the more controversial and the part that Jill will talk about in depth is that not all breast cancers can be cured, and not all breast cancers need to be treated. So while we may find a breast cancer. If that breast cancer is not one for which we currently have treatment, that early detection does not in and of itself lead to less death. Likewise, we may be diagnosing a great deal of breast cancer that never itself would progress to the type of disease that would kill someone. So the other thing that we've learned is that the type of tumor may matter more than the size. So the assumption that finding a small breast cancer is bet you know is the best thing to do because it will lead it will lead to better outcomes and that the larger the breast cancer the worse off it is. We now have some data to suggest that this kind of simplistic understanding is very problematic. All of these sorts of new understandings of breast cancer lead us to to rethink the idea that screenings and treatments have risks and benefits, and it is in weighing those risks and benefits that we make a decision about screening mammography. So here I want to reiterate that what we're talking about today is breast cancer screening. Screening refers to the testing of an otherwise healthy population with no, and those healthy women who have no breast symptoms. In other words, this is what we do to the general population that is at general risk for breast cancer. Screening is very different than diagnostic intervention. That is, when someone presents with a lump or someone has a very high risk, and we're using the mammography tool specifically on that, pop on that person to find a particular answer. And screening is performed because there are some breast cancers in which early detection and treatment reduce the risk of dying, so there are benefits to screening. But here, we, I do just want to reiterate that we are not talking about the use of mammography in diagnostic situations. We are only talking about the use of mammography in otherwise healthy women who themselves do not have breast symptoms or who themselves are not at particularly high risk of the disease. So this last bullet point here that, that is why we do screening is part of what the benefits are. We, the benefits of screening, in other words, how you decide which populations that you screen, they're dependent on how much disease there actually is in the population to find, and how likely that what you find can respond to the treatment. And Gil will talk about this in greater detail when he talks about what benefits we should be seeing from mammography. So overall, to date, the research had suggested about a 15% relative risk reduction in mortality. In other words, screening reduced the risk of dying by about 15%. Um, but the benefits only come when we think about absolute risk and not relative risk. So at this point, you may be saying, I don't really understand what the heck you are talking about, Tracy. Well, here, let me give you just a very basic, simple example to understand the difference between relative risk, which is the way we usually talk about benefits, and absolute risk which is really what the overall benefit is. So let's assume that there are 100 women in a population, and that two of them will die from breast cancer. And then we do some screening, and, in, and we reduce that to only one of the women in 100 women who will die of breast cancer. If we use a relative risk approach, we would think that this has been a hugely successful intervention. The re reduction, relative risk reduction of dying in this population is 
but the absolute risk reduction is 1%. And so if the harms occur to more than 1% of the population, you are in an unbalanced situation between risk and benefit. And this is why it's important when looking at science to decide whether or not we're talking about relative risk reduction or absolute risk reduction. Now in this, you can also tell that if there is more disease present, you will get higher rates of absolute risk reduction. Where there is less disease present, you will get lower risk even though the relative risk in a population might not really look that different. So based on this, the research suggests that the greatest absolute reduction for women occurs in women who are between the ages of 50 and 74, and that that is significantly different from the benefit in the absolute risk reduction for women aged 40 to 49. And this is why the US Preventative Services Task Force does not re recommend routine screening for women, for all women age 40 to 49. So the benefit clearly is in finding disease that is treatable that can reduce mortality. So what are the harms? The first harm is the harm that most people think about when they think about mammography, and that is false positive testing. False positive testing means finding something that later turns out not to be Many of you on this call may have had this experience. You had a screening mammography. They identified something that seemed suspicious. You underwent more testing. You might have even undergone a biopsy or some more intervention. And the final result was that you do not have breast cancer. This is what we call a false positive. Now, false positives increase the earlier a woman starts having mammographies and the more she has. So this is the younger you start, the more likely you are to encourage to have a false positive, and the more mammographies you have, the more you have false positives. This is why the US Preventative Services Task Force recommends mammography every other year as opposed to every year, which had been much of the historical way in which we did mammography. And false positives, both because of the lower prevalence of disease and the, the conditions of the breast, um, make false positive results more common for women age 40 to 49. Now you might ask, what's wrong with a false positive? So false positives can create an enormous amount of anxiety. They can be very disruptive in people's lives. And then more importantly, they can put people into a high surveillance environment that then creates more false positives and more intervention. And we'll talk later about that, sort of what happens when you get in that environment. The second harm for us to think about is the harm associated with mammography itself. Now mammography is a radiation-based technology. And we know that there are risks of breast cancer that directly come from, from radiation. So radiation itself is a risk factor for breast cancer. Women who have been exposed to radiation, in particular um, what we know about atomic weapon environment location is that radiation is a risk factor for breast cancer. So when you're using a technology that uses something we know to be a risk factor, we do have to have a different kind of question. Now the cumulative radiation, which is the concern, um, is changing for Americans, not just as a result of mammography, but as a result of all kinds of other interventions that have been increasing um, in the last two decades. Unfortunately, we have no data and no limit, no understanding of what the limits for radiation exposure should be at the individual level. So we know it's a theoretical risk, but we don't know when you cross the line into actual risk. So the conclusion based on this is given that we're uncertain about the possible relationship between cumulative radiation and mammography, we do need to consider this as a possible risk if there is no great benefit from the use of mammography. Before I talk about the next two aspects of mammography risk, um, that is overdiagnosis and overtreatment, I want to provide an easier way for us to think about this idea that breast cancer is more complicated than we used to think. Now this analogy comes from Barry Kramer at the National Cancer Institute, and it involves three sets of animals. The first set of animals are turtles. These are 
non-aggressive invasive disease. That is what, what is a breast cancer in the breast, but it never develops and becomes life-threatening. So it exists, but it just sort of marches along like a turtle and doesn't ever cause, it is not life-threatening. The second type of breast cancer are things called bears. These are the things that respond to the current treatment and, and do benefit from early detection. So if you think about it as this sort of tumor in hibernation, the bear, and what we're trying to do is identify it before it wakes up and becomes life-threatening. The third set of breast cancers are birds. These are very aggressive diseases that have flown away long before we can find them and cannot be effectively treated. So no matter how frequent you do mammography, or how, um, how early you find the disease, it in and of itself um, will be lethal. Of course, the big challenge is that currently we don't know how to tell the birds from the bears from the turtles in the mammography environment. So what we're diagnosing is all three of these. And in diagnosing all three of these, we have created new types of risks associated with mammography. And I would say with all screening, and Gil can talk more uh, generally about that. So this harm of overdiagnosis, this refers to women receiving a diagnosis of invasive or non-invasive breast cancer who have abnormal lesions. They have something in their breast that is wrong. But that is unlikely to ever become clinically evident. That is, it's not likely to, to, to manifest itself in a way that could be found, not looking on mammography during a lifetime in the absence of screening. In other words, if we hadn't gone to look for it, we never would have discovered this tumor. And this tumor itself is not um, a harmful or a risk to the woman's life. Maybe the greatest effect on women who have short life expectancy. This is why the US Preventative Services Task Force does not recommend routine screening for women over the age of 75. If you find disease in an older population, a disease that in and of itself would never be problematic for the woman, and you intervene, you may in fact shorten her life. That latter one suggests, but not just for the older population, but for all populations, a harm of overtreatment. Now, you all, many of you on this call will have had a personal experience either with yourself or with a loved one with breast cancer treatment. And you know that breast cancer treatment is not neutral. It often involves surgery, radiation, drugs, and major disruptions to people's lives, to their futures, and to their careers. So before we treat, we need to make sure that, we're, that people would actually benefit from the treatment. But for both the birds and the turtles, treatment does not actually improve the outcome. That does, it does not reduce the chance of dying and may, in fact, cause more harm than good. That could be because the disease itself was never going to be deadly. Those are the turtles. Now, it can be because the disease was caught earlier, and we treated in this early time, but it was really unnecessary. We could have waited until the disease presented at a later time, have the same benefit from treatment, but have done it not in the prime of a woman's life, but in a later time. Especially for women, if you think about age 40 to 50, which are often the high points of either their personal life or their professional life. And for many in the sandwich generation who are dealing with small children and older, older adults in their life, in having treatment at this time can be um, particularly hard. Or it could be because it is a bird, that we found a cancer that will be non-responsive to treatment. We've treated, but we've not improved outcome. So, on that, I'll turn it over to Gil, who will put this, these kinds of concepts into data that I hope will um, illuminate a new understanding of mammography. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, Saru, do I have uh, control? You should if you click on the screen. All right, very good. Um, what I'm going to do uh, <clears throat> this morning um, is uh, talk about an article I had with my colleague uh, Archie Blyer in the New England Journal uh, Thanksgiving of last year called The Effect of Three Decades of Screening Mammography on Breast Cancer Incidence. And my goal here is to help you uh, understand uh, the research. 
Uh, <coughs> there we go. I'm getting my controls working now. Uh, and before I uh, start with the study, I want to make sure we're all on the same page on the about the two prerequisites for screening to lower mortality because they're important to understand to understand what we were testing in the study. And the two prerequisites are this. Uh, first, screening must advance the time of diagnosis of cancers destined to cause death. It's got to find those bad cancers earlier, those destined to find cause death. We've got to find them earlier in time. That's the first uh, prerequisite. The second one is that early treatment of those cancers, those cancers destined to cause death, must confer some advantage over late treatment. If they could be treated just as well later, then screening hasn't uh, produced any advantage. Now I'll put that one in the background because it's really this first prerequisite that's important to understand. Screening must advance the time of diagnosis of cancers destined to cause death. Given that, it is not enough simply to find more early stage cancer. In addition, you must see some subsequent decline in those diagnosed with late stage cancer. In other words, if screening is working, the number of women who present with late stage cancer should go down because they've been advanced to an earlier stage. This is a picture uh, of what an effective screening program should do, uh, looking at the incidence, the occurrence of new disease over time. Imagine that early stage cancer starts here and late stage cancer starts uh, here. And this is about their relative position in breast cancer in the late 1970s. Once you initiate screening, you expect to see an increase in the amount of early stage cancer. But at the same time, you expect to see a concomitant decrease in late stage cancer. In other words, the total of these two curves should stay roughly the same. Screening shouldn't cause additional cancers. So back to the article. And our question was, what has actually happened following the introduction of screening mammography in the United States? Well, this is a slide of stage-specific incidence of breast cancer in women age 40 and older in the United States. We're looking at the period 1975 to 2008. And this is what has happened to early stage disease. There's been a dramatic uh, increase, almost a doubling, in uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, population age 40 and older. Now, just to be clear, this is temporally totally related to the introduction of mammography use. I'll superimpose it here. And these data uh, reflect the National Health Interview Survey. And you can see the first time they asked the question about whether you had a mammography in the last two years was 1985 to 1970. And about 30% of women age 40 and older had had a mammogram in the last two years. That number increased to about 50% just before 1990, 60% uh, in the early 1990s, and got up around 70% uh, in 2000 and 2005 in that period, stabilized around there. So this is our uh, first finding, that following the introduction of screening mammography in women age 40 and older, the number of women diagnosed with early stage breast cancer has roughly doubled. So that is the picture for early stage breast cancer in women age 40 and older in the United States. Here is the picture for late stage uh, breast cancer. And as you can see, there hasn't been much change. A small decline, but not much. And that's our second finding. There's been little compensatory decrease in the number of women presenting with late stage breast cancer, suggesting that mammography has largely failed this first prerequisite of an effective screening program. So here's the picture again. Early stage, dramatic increase, little change in late stage disease. And the question we ask is, well, is there some other reason for this? Is there some change in the underlying amount of cancer that might explain this? And so we looked at the stage-specific incidence in women under age 40. And I'll put, show you those now. This is early stage in women under age 40. This is late stage breast cancer in women under age 40. This is the group that has not been exposed to mammography largely. 
And as you can see, there's been very little change in the amount of breast cancer in this group. So that's our third finding. <clears throat> there's been little change in the rate of breast cancer among women under age 40. That's the group not exposed to mammography, suggesting there's not been a dramatic change in the underlying amount of breast cancer. So this imbalance, a lot more early stage disease, not much decline in late stage disease, that suggests two things. First, screening mammography largely failed, the first prerequisite for a successful screening program. And second, screening mammography is associated with a substantial amount of overdiagnosis. Now, as Tracy suggested, overdiagnosis is the detection of a cancer that was otherwise never going to appear, never going to bother the patient, only found because of screening. Now, all this extra cancer found in the early stage, with a, only a small decline in the deficit in the late stage, suggests there's a lot of extra cancers being found, cancers that are overdiagnosed. And even after excluding the transient excess incidence associated with hormone replacement, which is happening up in this period, this spike here, and correcting for the tiny increase in incidence observed in women under age 40, about 0.25% per year, we estimate that about 1.3 million women have been overdiagnosed. Now, <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about what this excess early stage disease is. This is the early stage curve decomposed into its two components, localized disease and ductal carcinoma in situ. Now, ductal carcinoma in situ is the earliest form of breast cancer. And as you can see, it was virtually not found in the 1970-1980 period. And this agrees with the finding there's, there's very little screening mammography being done at that time because, in fact, DCIS is almost only found with screening mammography. And it's increased dramatically. But also notice that localized invasive breast cancer increases dramatically as well. And that is our fourth finding, that, in fact, the overdiagnosis of early stage breast cancer is not simply about ductal carcinoma in situ. About half are localized invasive breast cancers. Now this may sound like a very disturbing and unhappy message, and so it's very important to step back and recognize there is good news here. The breast cancer death rate is falling. That is unequivocally good news. But the good news is about treatment, not screening. Now why do we say that? Well first, screening mammography has had little effect on the rate at which women are diagnosed with late stage cancer. That's that first prerequisite I started with. Now let's look at that effect on late stage cancer a little bit more carefully. We're talking about this curve here, the yellow curve, and I'm now going to change the axis on the ax uh, uh, on the y axis so we can see the curve a little bit better. That is the late stage disease. And now I want to decompress the disease. Uh, uh, deconstruct this curve into its two component parts. The first is regional. As you can see, it's largely made up of regional uh, disease. And that is, in breast cancer, largely node-positive disease, axillary node-positive disease. And by and large, we can treat these women successfully. This has been one of the, this is the group that's probably experienced the greatest benefit from new treatments, particularly anti-estrogen drugs and adjuvant chemotherapy. The other component is metastatic disease. Uh, this has not changed at all. This is the group that would really benefit from an advance in their time of diagnosis. And unfortunately, mammography has not been able to affect that. So that suggests the rate at which women present with metastatic breast cancer, a stage that's extremely difficult to treat, sadly appears not to have been affected by screening. We also made the observation that the decline in death among women exposed to screening, those age 40 and older, is about the same as the decline in women not exposed to screening under age 40, suggesting, again, that the benefit, the good news in breast cancer is about improved treatment, 
not screening. Our best guess is that the mortality benefit of screening mammography is small, less than a 10% relative decline in breast cancer mortality. The overdiagnosis harm is substantial. Approximately half of screen detected breast cancers appear now to represent overdiagnosis. Now, important caveat that Tracy mentioned, I want to mention it again, that these data say nothing about the value of diagnostic mammograms. That's when a woman with a breast lump gets a mammogram to learn if it's something to worry about. There's no debate about mammography here. We all agree diagnostic mammograms serve an important role. So the bottom line, these data raise serious concerns about the value of screening mammography. They clarify that the mortality benefit is likely smaller and the harm of overdiagnosis likely larger than has been previously recognized. While women should recognize that our work does not answer the question, should I be screened for breast cancer, they can rest assured that the question has more than one right answer. Saru? Thank you so much, Gilbert. It's a wonderful presentation. And um, I want to, again, um, just what Gil and uh, Tracy were saying, that we're, you know, we're talking about screening mammography, not diagnostic mammography. And I also want to, um, to say that there's really a difference between mammography choices for women who are considered to be high risk versus low risk. And I want to take a moment to talk about and think about one of those high risk groups, which is uh, specifically African American women. Now, African American women have the highest breast cancer death rate of all racial and ethnic groups. And they're 40% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. They also have differences, um, substantial differences in tumor characteristics. And this is not specific to just African American women, but um, that's who I'm focusing on today. With African American women having a greater likelihood of being diagnosed with hormone negative tumors and more aggressive tumors, both are uh, much more difficult to treat, which um, Tracy and um, Gilbert both talked about. So this idea of early detection uh, reducing cancer mortality rates really fails to take into that account, take into account the reality that some tumors are just so aggressive that even early detection will fail to eradicate them. And as Gilbert explained very clearly, the reduction in mortality we expected uh, to see with increased rates of mammography have not materialized um, in this population as well. And initially, um, thought to be the result of lower breast screening rates among African American women, the difference in mortality rates, again, um, despite higher rates of mammography now, um, have not shown to make an improvement in mortality in African American women. And really, more recent research looking at women under 40 suggests that African American women, women undergoing screening are more likely than their white counterparts to be recalled for additional workup and to receive both false positive and true positive results. Um, that is, both false alarms and also a diagnosis of breast cancer. And while higher rates um, with mammography in African American communities have not led to this anticipated decline in mortality, Mammography for a long time has been a very important community empowerment tool for African American communities. And it's important um, to not forget that and to search for other tools that can be used um, for empowerment in these communities. So I want to take a moment to um, sort of recap this rethinking of mammography. And um, what we're seeing is that mammography is not always the best screening tool. We're seeing that it's less effective in premenopausal women, and that's why we talk about that 50-year um, line. It's also less effective in dense breast tissue, which is much more common in premenopausal women under 50. And as Tracy talked about, um, mammograms find cancer that shouldn't be found. Mammograms also don't find cancers that need to be found. And mammography is a radiation-based tool. And because we don't know enough about an individual's cumulative exposure to radiation, um, it's something that we need to sort of give pause and, and understand that. And as Gil
Gilbert laid out so clearly, breast cancer death rates have changed only slightly, and much of that change is really due to advances in treatment, not screening. So we need to be careful about how we talk about the benefits of screening and remember that uh, screening mammography might not be the gold standard in all circumstances. And breast cancer prevention, identification, and care is much more than just mammography. And if a woman chooses not to do a mammogram, it doesn't mean that she's chose to do nothing. Breast Cancer Action um, came out a few years ago with some screening guidelines. Um, and I want to uh, talk about those now. These screening guidelines are uh, specifically for non-African American women who have no family history of breast cancer, no prior history of significant chest radiation, and no elevated risk for breast cancer. So basically, this is for women who are low risk or average risk. These are the screening guidelines that Breast Cancer Action um, has. So beginning at menopause, um, to have a mammogram every other year until the age of 75. And after 75, to have them at intervals that take into consideration other health conditions. So women who are younger than age 50 who may be pr particularly concerned about breast cancer may wish to start mammography earlier. Um, but it's important to be aware, as we've talked about today, that there are the higher risks of false positives and really the reality that mammography might not be as effective in premenopausal um, women. The other part is clinical breast exams, and ideally having these every year, at least once uh, every three years. Um, and it's really important that clinical breast exams be performed by someone who's been formally trained to do it. It doesn't need to be a doctor, just a healthcare provider who's been formally trained in clinical breast exams. And last, to know your body. Um, and it's really um, up to an individual how, how they go about doing that. We know that a third of all breast cancers are found by women themselves. So it's important to know the size, shape, and feel um, of your breast. So if there are any other changes, you, they can be reported to a healthcare provider, and um, your options can be um, pursued based on that, according to really the, the wishes of the individual. So the talk to your doctor approach can um, be a little insufficient to help women make informed choices. Uh, healthcare providers may be concerned about liability resulting from their failure to start um, mammography, but it's still really important to proactively have a conversation with your healthcare provider about mammography. And, um, we have some questions, some conversation starters uh, that may help you initiate this conversation. I'm going to uh, highlight just a couple of them. The first is, how do you evaluate my personal risk for breast cancer, and what do you consider in evaluating that risk? Uh, different women have different personal risk factors, and it's important to understand each individual's personal risk factors um, in evaluating their individual risk. What do you see the risks and benefits of a mammogram for me at my age? And, and we've talked a lot about what some of those risks and benefits might be, and it's important to proactively have that conversation with your healthcare provider. And last, what alternatives might be available to me if I don't want to get a mammogram at this time? So these conversation starters are really useful because uh, I think some healthcare providers may not be aware of uh, more recent science around breast cancer screening. They may have their own personal beliefs and attitudes around risks and benefits of screening. And even still, for some, there may be a financial interest in promoting screening because they uh, may own their own screening or diagnostic equipment. So for all these reasons, uh, we really encourage women to understand the risks and benefits of breast cancer screening and make sure that it's a personal decision whether or not to undergo screening and when to start. And really the most important aspect of the discussion with the healthcare provider is that you should feel that your decisions are being respected and supported no matter what those decisions are. I want to talk a little bit about some additional resources. Breast Cancer Action Screening and Early Detection Policy uh, lays out the recommendations that I spoke about, the guidelines, um, for women who are not at elevated risk for breast cancer. And again, we really believe that all women should have the information about risks benefits of breast cancer screening technologies in order to make their own decision, and um, this policy can uh, help give you some of that information. There are two really great books 
um, if you'd like to learn more about mammography and screening. The first is The Big Squeeze, The Social and Political History of the Controversial Mammogram by Handel Reynolds. And the other um, is Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. And this is um, by Dr. Gilbert Welch. If you're really interested in this issue of overdiagnosis, there will be a conference that will focus on this issue in September in Hanover, New Hampshire. And um, you can um, look that up. It's called Preventing Overdiagnosis. And the last is that a recording uh, of this webinar will be available on our website if you'd like to view it again or recommend it to friends and family. But if you're interested in viewing um, Gilbert's presentation again, you can view it at the YouTube link that's on your screen. Um, and just to let everyone know on the call that I will be sending a follow-up email that will have all of these additional resources in it. So if you're not able to uh, take all the information down now, you will get it in an email. So we're going to open it up to your questions in just a minute. But before we do, I want to talk about uh, how you can get involved with Breast Cancer Action. You can become a member and sign up for our news and action alert emails to keep up to date on the issues. You can join us on Facebook and Twitter to connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can also help others get involved. Tell your friends, coworkers, and family about this webinar and how they can get involved. And last, you can donate to support our education and advocacy work. I'm going to take a moment um, to talk a little bit about some other work that we're doing here at Breast Cancer Action. Um, there is uh, a court case that the Supreme Court will be hearing around uh, human gene patents. And currently, uh, a company called Myriad Genetics owns a patent on the human BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are commonly known as the breast cancer gene. Breast Cancer Action is the only national breast cancer organization that's a plaintiff in this case. And we believe that a Supreme Court decision to outlaw human gene patents even is necessary because human gene patents actively harm women's health. We feel that when a corporation owns human genes, corporate profits, excuse me, corporate profits will always come before our health. So Breast Cancer Action has a rally planned on the steps of the Supreme Court on April 15th, which is when uh, oral arguments will be heard. And uh, we invite anyone who's concerned about the right of corporations to patent human genes to join us on April 15th at 9.30 in the morning. And you can find out more information on our website. Again, I want to remind you that Breast Cancer Action relies on your support to make these webinars possible, and your individual support of our work is so crucial. If you've been inspired today, please consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue these webinars. I want to give a really big thank you to Tracy and Gilbert for their presentation today. And now um, I'd like to open it up to your questions. And we've had people uh, writing in questions as we've been going through our presentation. I'm going to take a look at them, and uh, we'll, we'll try to start answering some of them. Um, so there's a question by um, an, a listener who says, um, how, how do we interpret guidelines for different age women regarding mammography? I think that's a, a good question. I don't know, Tracy or um, Gilbert, if either of you would like to try and answer that. Well, the uh, only thing I'll say is, of course, there are a lot of different uh, guidelines out there, uh, some much more aggressive than others. Uh, the question was, how do, they, how do we interpret them for women of different ages? Um, I, I think one of the things that, that you may have heard uh, in the course of this uh, webinar but would be worth um, <clears throat> restating is is the people who stand to benefit the most from screening and to be the least likely overdiagnosed are those at the highest risk for uh, developing cancer. So obviously there's very high risk groups uh, for whom uh, may be more uh, uh, interested in pursuing screening. One of the most obvious risk factors is age and this is why there has been a general uh, uh, more conservative move towards women in the younger age group, both because the cancers are hard to find, and two, because the absolute benefit is so small. So in general, as women age, they stand to benefit more. But then at the other end of age, you have to start thinking about the competing risks of death, um, and in which case when people have a limited life expectancy, there's no purpose to undergo screening of any sort, uh, because uh, the whole point of screening is to catch something early, and something early may not be important if uh, you're bound to die from something else. So there's sort of this uh, balance between uh, uh, the screening probably, uh, if, if it works, um, if, if people are interested, and at the time when it's most likely to have a benefit is sort of in that middle age group. And the guidelines tend to reflect that basic pattern. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. 
Um, so I, I just want to take a moment. There's a lot of questions um, that people are asking um, that are really great, great questions, but they're um, individual questions um, that I think would be best um, taken up with a healthcare provider. Um, a lot of these questions are about an individual's specific um, potential screening um, history or um, ideas on should I get a mammogram or should I not get a mammogram. So I, I just want to encourage people who are asking these questions. These are the right questions to be asking. Um, but I think that these questions are um, should be directed to healthcare providers who can really talk to you about your individual risk and your individual um, medical, who know your medical history. Um, there, there's um, a question that someone asked about um, LCIS, which is lobular um, carcinoma in situ. Um, do either of you want to take a moment just to talk about the difference between that and um, DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ? Well, I, I, I'll say that traditionally LCIS, uh, lobular carcinoma in situ, has not been seen as an obligate uh, precursor to cancer. It is typically not included um, in the, uh, in the, as a cancer uh, diagnosis. Um, and, and that's all I, I can say about that. I know there's been more interest in it, interest in it recently, but I, I just don't think we have a lot of data. We have enough problems trying to figure out whether DCIS is something we should care about. Right. I think it's also not, it's not, it, it hasn't, again, it hasn't come up quite as much um, like you, you were talking about, um, Gilbert, and, and so um, focus, there hasn't been quite as much focus. Um, and it's not considered a pre-cancer like DCIS is. Um, there, there are a number of questions related to um, other types of screening, uh, thermography, ultrasound, and MRIs. Um, would either of you care to um, just mention something about how those fit into um, the screening sure, I'll for breast cancer? I'll just say that currently we don't use any of those technologies for screening. We use them in diagnostic situations. Um, and so what we know about mammography, we know even less about the potential of these tools to do um, in a screening environment. I think what's important as we think about these other kinds of technologies is to remember that this, that, that our assumption is that we've got to find a good tool to find um, cancer earlier. And what we need is tools that tell us the difference between the turtles, the bears, and the birds. And it, it's not about which technologies can find earlier, which is, I think, what we, what we think we want to go to. But also that um, overdiagnosis and overtreatment are going to be problems for any screening technology. I think that's what's so exciting about where Gil's work is going and this conference is to recognize that these aren't problems about breast cancer. These are problems about an entire sort of screening as the solution mentality that we have adopted in this country. And what I and the reason that I, you know, am on the board of breast cancer action is that I think when our focus stays there, rather than our focus changes to what are the true causes of cancer, what are the things that not, our focus isn't in early detection and therefore treatment, our focus is in what does the prevention actually look like, um, that we, we sometimes need to shift our lens around the solution. Um, and Gil, I'm just really excited about the way in which you're bringing together overdiagnosis and overtreatment across a range of cancers to begin to Thank get us to see that it's not just a breast cancer problem. So whether we move from mammography to thermography or mammography to ultrasound, we're still in the same problematic framework for the way in which we think about cancer. Uh, th th that's right, I, and I appreciate uh, you extending this because uh, the, the audience may not recognize that the problems uh, that 
that I'm uh, and others are highlighting with mammography are general uh, problems with screening, and and we really learned this the hard way with prostate cancer screening, and we're just beginning to recognize that all cancers are much more heterogeneous than we. Uh, uh, previously thought. Whenever we look for early forms, we find more than we would expect, and we know we're getting into the problem of overdiagnosis. And Saru, if, if I might, I, I thought since you had so many questions about what I should do, and even though I don't know any of the individuals uh, on the other end of the line, um, I, I, I would like to say something about the mammography decision. And, and I guess the, the first thing I should say is there is no right answer. And, and so, so people should know that there's not one single uh, right answer. And uh, unfortunately, I think the reality is there's not even perfect information with which to make your own decision. I mean, that, that, that people will have very different uh, estimates of exactly how beneficial uh, the test is. Uh, some some um, argue that the relative risk reduction is as high as 30%. Uh, others uh, argue that uh, wonder uh, whether mammography really has any benefit. And there's a, a group of people in Europe that are, are, are really questioning whether it's uh, having any benefit in this world. I think the one thing that people uh, should know is whatever uh, estimate of mortality benefit we talk about, it's going to affect a very few people. But by that I mean if you screen a thousand women for ten years. Um, that range is going to be uh, among zero to three that will be helped, uh, taking uh, you know the, the extremes of, of, of uh, no reduction to 30 percent reduction. We're talking about a very few people. The harms affect a much larger number of people, um, and some people may not consider these uh, to be harms, but uh, let's just go over them. The false alarm problem is, is disturbingly common uh, in this country. Uh, the number of women of 1,000 being screened for 10 years annually is going to be in the range of 300 to 700 that have some false alarm. Uh, the overdiagnosis harm is less common than that. It, it's more on the range of 5 to 20 among 1,000 screened for 10 years. Now these are different things. These are apples and oranges. And one of the things you have to uh, think about as you think about the decision is how you value these things. Some people will do anything uh, to achieve a potential mortality benefit. That's understandable. That's fine as long as they go in understanding the associated harms. Some people really want to avoid unnecessary medicalization, uh, want to avoid that, and will accept the possibility of foregoing some small change in mortality to avoid the more common events uh, of uh, the false alarms and overdiagnosis. And I don't know if that helps. There's no perfect calculus to do this. And that's why I think it's a very personal choice. Thank you. Um, I just want to say um, someone here on staff actually um, said that right now with um, the LCIS lobular carcinoma in situ, it's usually watch and wait. Um, and that the Center for Research on Women and Families actually have some, some good info um, on it if, if people are interested. Um, so I, I wanted to um, wrap up that there were a number of questions on um, if people could get these slides or listen to this presentation again. And yes, we um, always record uh, a copy of our webinars and we put them up on our website about a week after they air. And I will be following up with everyone with an email and in that email there will be a copy of the slides. PDF of these slides, so you will be able to have them and look at them again. Um, so I want to thank everyone. We have a number of really great questions, and I want to um, let everyone know that if your question didn't get answered, you can follow up with us at info at bcaction.org. And I want to really give a big, big thank you um, again to Tracy and Gilbert, um, and thank you all for your questions and comments um, and your attention. Um, and for attending. And again, that email that I'll be sending will also have a short survey where you can provide feedback on this webinar. So thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, and thanks everyone for attending. Thank you.